Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to 90 and Out. I'm your host, Timothy Holt. And right now, uh, I am preparing for our youth night tonight at Six Points. We are going through Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. He's writing to Christians. Um, so we need to keep that in mind when we're looking at these ancient documents. Uh, one of that is who, what, where, when, why. So how I approach reading the Bible is generally with those five things. So who is, who's writing and who are they writing to? The primary audience, the secondary audience, and the tertiary audience. We, 2,000 years later, are in the tertiary audience. Um, we are not the primary audience. We're not the primary subject um, recipients of these ancient letters. We aren't the secondary recipients. We are the tertiary recipients because of time. So who was the primary audience? Uh, who was writing? Who was the primary audience? And why? So who, what, what does the text actually say? So uh, I find it a good idea to read from various English translations. Um, mainly because I don't read ancient Greek, which is what these were written in, were common Greek at the time. And I don't read ancient Greek. Um, so I take other people's word for the translations, and that's why I read from numerous English translations. Uh, I will look up some ancient Greek words here and there, but generally speaking, um, I don't. So you're more than welcome to, and I would encourage you to do so if that's something you're interested in. So what does the text actually say? Uh, there are thousands of copies of this text. Um, so with thousands of copies, we can compare and contrast, and people spend their entire lives doing just that, looking at them and comparing and contrasting the um, meticulous translations and copies. So. The other thing is, so that's who, what, where. Where were these written? Um, where were they written? So when it comes to Paul's letter, he's in ancient um, Asia Minor slash Greece, which is part of the Roman Empire. Okay. And he's writing to Corinth, which is on the land bridge, the isthmus between the mainland of Greece and the Peloponnese of Greece. So the mainland of Greece, predominantly um, spearheaded by Athens, and the Peloponnese is spearheaded by Sparta. Um, so there is this cosmopolitan element of Corinth that we need to be looking at and keeping in mind. Cosmopolitan, because if it went by sea, it went through Corinth because of the tides in the Mediterranean and the winds. Uh, so it was safer and less expensive to dock on the Adrian, uh, Adriatic Sea versus um, going across and sailing around the Peloponnese. It was easier and less expensive to simply dock in Corinth, transfer that cargo across land four miles, and then board it onto another ship. If the ship was small enough, they would actually dry dock the ship, put it on a cart, and haul it four miles uh, across the isthmus. So there's a lot of money, a lot of trade, a lot of commerce going on. There's also a lot of migration going on uh, with Corinth, people from the Far East, the Middle East, as well as the Western half of the empire. So Corinth is a destination location. Um, some historians have related it to having Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and New York City all in one city. And I think that's an apt description. So, who, what, where, and when? When are these being written? Well, for Paul's second letter to the Corinth uh, Christians, it is being written about 56 AD, 57 AD. So what's going on at that time? Well, you have Emperor Nero um, running the show out of Rome, and he was not friendly to Christians, to put it nicely. Um, 
you have other things going on at that time frame, it's about 20 years, a little over, about 25 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. You've got um, some fairly young Christians going on um, in Corinth. The church was started about 50 AD with Paul being there in 50 and 51 AD. His first letter being written about a year before this one in 55 AD. So there's quite a bit of cultural things going on. And you got to look at that time frame because clearly he's writing to his primary audience at that time. And we are just getting some benefit from that. Um, by reading it now. So, who, what, where, when was it written and why? Why is just as important as the other four um, W questions. Why is Paul writing this letter? And we can figure out why he's writing it by simply reading the letter. Um, he says why he's writing it in the first chapter um, and frequently references it the why throughout it. And that's what we were really studying is why was this written? Um, which leads me to what we're going to be discussing in youth night, uh, teen night tonight. We are in chapter two and uh, we are going to be covering the first part of that chapter, which Paul's talking about some uh, pretty egregious wrongs and how we should handle those specifically how the Christians in Corinth should handle them, as well as uh, us as his tertiary audience. So uh, let's get to it. Let's get into the reading of this ancient letter and what it has for us today. And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you, all that my joy is the joy of all of you. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. Not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me but all of you, to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. So that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also wrote, that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if I indeed have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we ought, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Okay, so uh, that was a, um, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, I can just imagine the Christians. So letters in ancient Rome, in the ancient Roman Empire, were delivered by Couriers, either couriers of the empire, um, similar to our United States Postal Service, or by private courier. And um, generally speaking, because illiteracy was rampant in ancient Rome, uh, even in a wealthy city like Corinth, the general population typically were illiterate. Uh, so what would happen is you would hire a courier who was literate, and they would be trusted to take your letter to its intended audience and recipient. And as soon as they announced themselves, they would start reading. Um, and they would simply read it aloud 
generally with some type of uh, pomp and circumstance. So some type of uh, hand gestures and, and enthusiasm. So, um, that's one reason why I like to read aloud these letters because it gives me more of that impact of the original audience would have. Uh, they would be gathered together and this courier would announce themselves and say, hey, I have a letter and here it is. And then just start reading it. That's why you see Paul start his letters the way he does. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Acadia, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he starts his letters those way, that way, because it addresses who the letter is from and who it is to. And it was understood it would just, the courier would simply say, hey, I have a letter. And the intended audience would gather together and the courier would just start reading, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, so that's why I read the way I do, read the Bible the way I do. Um, but let's get back to what we're going to be discussing with the teens tonight. Um, and discussing with you right now as you're watching this video. By the way, if you have any comments, uh, please put them in the comment section. I would love it if you commented. Good, bad, ugly, snide remarks, they're all welcome. Um, keep it uh, rated G, by the way, um, in those responses because YouTube will flag anything that they consider to be vulgar or inappropriate uh, and I won't be able to see it very well, readily available. So neither will anyone else. So if you want to have a conversation about this text, please, let's have that conversation. Atheists are welcome, agnostics, Catholics, Protestants, Baptists, you name it, um, Muslims, Jews, all of you. Uh, if you're Hindu, whatever your background is, you want to have a conversation, let's, let's do that. Uh, so. I write, wrote this very thing. So Paul here is referencing a previous letter. No, it's not 1 Corinthians. Uh, it's actually a letter that's been lost to time. Uh, it's known as the painful letter. And um, the reason I say it's not 1 Corinthians because there's nothing really in the letter First Corinthians that we know of as 1 Corinthians that I would consider to be painful and full of anguish. Um, but there is in this letter, and he's talking about a specific individual in their congregation that has done some pretty egregious wrongs and, and harmed a lot of people with many tears. Uh, if you look at um, verse 4, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you, and with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. I get this impression of a dad writing his um, son or daughter who's off at college or somewhere else and saying, hey, I'm writing uh, this painful thing that's, that's just bringing tears to my eyes while I'm writing this to you. Uh, not because I want harm to come to you, not because I'm a... Uh, uh, I want our relationship to have a fundamental breakdown and schism and, and just part ways, but because I love you so much and I see this, this <laughs> you going in such a bad way that I want to go, hey, wake up. There's been several times in my life where there's places, uh, people that I'm like, hey, <laughs> you are screwing up so badly. Um, wake up! And I get that impression from Paul um, that he's, he's, that's how he's addressing this. Um, and he wrote this letter. Um, I, don't, I know the teens have Snapchat and some other uh, apps where they communicate and talk with each other. And every once in a while, um, my teenage boys and daughter, I will overhear them going, Wow, that was harsh. 
Ouch! And that's the impression I get from this lost letter that, that as soon as this courier started reading and it sunk in, because typically they would um, deliver it sealed and just open it and start reading cold. Um, and I just get this letter, this middle letter between first and second Corinthians lost to time that when this courier just started reading it, they're like, ouch, that was harsh. <laughs> and Paul recognizes that it must have been a big slap in the face. Um, and he's trying to reconcile that. By the way, I'm reading from the New King James English translation of the Bible. If you read from a different translation, let me know in the comments. Um, tell me what the differences are in the nuance and language, how it's it's done, because I I thoroughly enjoy those kind of conversations. Also, um, at youth night, I encourage the teens to bring their own Bibles or to pick up one of the Bibles, various Bibles that we have sitting on the shelf in the classroom so we can compare and contrast these differences because some of them are minor, some of them are major, uh, but they're, again, an English translation from all of these ancient documents, some of them in Latin, some of them in Greek, but the originals were all in ancient Greek. So. Verse 5, but if anyone has caused a grief, caused grief. Wow, that's everyone, right? If anyone has caused grief, uh, everyone causes grief at some point in time. Um, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. Uh, I think that's Paul going, ooh, let me dial back a little bit here. Uh, yeah, that was a pretty big problem and grief and pain. But we need to dial back. We need to not, um, we, we need to dial back. And then he says in verse six, this punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. So uh, apparently whatever this wrong was, it was dealt with by the majority of the Christians in that um, church. And it was pretty, pretty severe uh, from but sufficient for such a man so that on the contrary you ought rather to forgive and comfort him so the punishment's already been meshed out and handed down so now it's time to forgive move on and um, reconcile that relationship the wrong was committed the punishment was meted out now we need to move on and have that reconciliation that relationship by the way, if you are harboring bitterness, resentment against anyone, I highly recommend you take Paul's advice here and um, forgive and comfort. Lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up by too much sorrow. That would be bitterness. Uh, the relationship is important. We are relational creatures as humans and we crave that. So don't let the bitterness well up within you, the resentment, the hatred. Forgive and uh, let's come together in that forgiveness. Let's move beyond whatever the wrong or slight was. Uh, for this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Wow, that is a high, high uh, calling, right? I mean, let's face it. Paul uh, elsewhere says, follow me as I follow Christ, referring to Jesus of Nazareth. And those, man, read the four biographies. And if you don't get the impression that that standard is way up there, then I don't think we're reading the same four biographies. He, he says, uh, turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile. That's all coming from Jesus. All those... Um, adage uh, sayings come from Jesus. You're quoting the Bible when you say, hey, you should turn the other cheek, or hey, you should uh, walk an extra mile, or hey, walk a mile in my shoes. That is quoting Jesus. 
So when you're quoting Jesus and you don't realize it, hey, it happens. It's part of our culture uh, here in the United States. Um, there's a lot of quotations from the Christian Bible that's just part of our lexicon. And I think the m majority of people have no idea where those um, euphemisms come from, but it's generally the Bible. Um, so let oh yeah, forgiveness. So if we look at uh, obedient in all things, he immediately jumps into what he's referring to specifically here uh, when he says all obedient in all things. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. If indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. He's referring back to that um, guy or gal who did all those egregious, painful wrongs. He's saying, I've forgiven that guy. I've forgiven that lady. I've forgiven that person for all of the pain and sorrow and anguish and damages. And you should also. <laughs> that's, that's a big deal. Um, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant, ignorant of his devices. He's referring to bitterness and resentment, contention that, um, have you ever walked into a room when someone's in that room and uh, you've and, and heard someone said, man, you can cut the tension here with a knife. Yeah, that tension is that, uh, that harboring, that lack of forgiveness. There is something that happened and the past that causes that tension and you're uneasy and, and you're set it apart and you just can't seem to be comfortable yeah there's probably something going on there uh, interpersonally and that's the devices that Satan uses he uses those those little little things that just creep up that we don't let go uh, I heard one person relate humans to garbage trucks. Throughout our day, we pick up trash. Just as humans, we, we pick up that trash of life, those stresses of life. And then at some point in time, our garbage truck are, is overflowing with trash and we just unload. And unfortunately, it seems like we unload on the people we care about the most. We have to be mindful of that. And Paul is saying to these Christians and to us, forgive. Let those things go. Uh, let them just go away. And if you're having a hard time doing that, um, forgive in the presence of Christ. Pray about it. Pray to God. Through Jesus Christ. He is there for us to pray and get that comfort and that forgiveness. Because I'm going to be honest, there's definitely been times in my life where I've had a very difficult time forgiving people. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, I'm human like, like the rest of us. And I have to pray about that. And sometimes I have to pray a lot um, to get to that forgiveness where I'm going to let it go and say, hey, I'm not going to count it against you anymore. Um, forgiveness is not about what they do. It's about who you are. Okay. When you forgive some, you say, hey, I recognize you wronged me in some way. You harmed me in some way, but I'm not going to count that against you anymore. Um, a friend of mine, he put it this way. He said, it's like that credit card where you rack up a, a ton of charges on a credit card. Okay. And you owe that money. But the credit card company says, you know what? We know you owe us money, but we're not going to charge you anymore for it. We're going to write it off. We're going to forgive that debt. And you don't owe us anymore. That's a pretty big deal. Okay. And if you want a peaceful life, follow Paul's advice here. Forgive. I, I know it sounds easy, but it's really not. It's hard to forgive people. It's easy to lash out at them. It's easy to hold bitterness and resentment and hatred. It's easy to count it against them and to hang on to that. But if you let it go, 
you will be better for it. And so will they. A lot of times when we harbor bitterness, resentment towards someone for something they did wrong against us, they have no idea. They've already moved on. So why don't we? Um, that is what we're going to be talking about tonight in uh, our youth night is these few verses here and what it means for us. If we um, get to it with the conversation, we will probably continue on through this chapter where Paul talks about Jesus and how we are able to forgive through Christ. He calls it the triumph in Christ, um, Christ's gospel, gospel meaning good news. Okay, the door being open. Um, I'm just gonna close out this, this video with reading this part, all right? So if you're a teen, come to our youth night uh, at six points if you're uh, in this area. If you want to get in touch with me, you can um, through various uh, social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, all right? I'm on Twitter. And let's get that conversation going, okay? So Paul, verse 12, chapter two to those ancient Corinth's Christian, Corinthian Christians. Furthermore, when I came to Troas, Troas, by the way, is a city in Asia Minor, to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I did not find Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed to Ma for Macedonia, now, thanks be to God for always, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many puddling the word of God, but as the sincerity, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. So if um, tonight we get to this where Paul's using the concept of a fragranted candle or perfume to illustrate the difference between being a Christian and a non-Christian, um, we'll get to it. But the focus of tonight is the first half of this chapter talking about forgiveness. So like I said earlier, if you have any comments, let me know. If you want to discuss this further, please uh, comment down below. And if you are a teenager and you're struggling or curious or whatever it is, and you want to know more about these ancient documents, let me know. I would love to hear from you. Um, I'm Timothy Holt. Uh, don't take my word for anything these ancient documents have to say. Pick them up, read them for yourself, and may God bless you.